3D Bioprinting by Abir Sinyal with the Nguyen Lab at UNC Chapel Hill. We print things all the time. Whether they're documents, posters, or flyers, printing is an important technology in our daily lives. Relatively recently, however, printing took a big step forward with 3D printing. We could build a 3D model on the computer, send it to the printer, and we could have that object in our hands in hardly any time. What if I told you that this isn't the limit? There is more to explore. What if we could print living things made up of cells? We could make blood vessels, tissues, and organs. We could help the hundreds of thousands of people waiting on transplant lists. This idea is not too far from reality if we use 3D bioprinting. 3D bioprinting is just like normal 3D printing, except it uses living cells as ink to create living structures. Like 3D printing, you have to create a model on a computer, then layer by layer, your living structure will be printed. The first step in the process is known as pre-bioprinting. Here, the desired product is determined and studied. Oftentimes, 3D scans, such as CT scans or MRI images, are taken of the desired product and are then converted into a series of 2D images to serve as a template for the different layers. Cells are then isolated and extracted from an organism, which is often the recipient of the product, in order to create bioink. Bioink is one of the most important parts of the 3D bioprinting process. It starts with the cells that were extracted. Then, molecules called hydrogels are added to provide water for the cells. Other nutrients and chemicals are added so that the cells can grow and communicate as if they were in a living body. Once the bioink is developed, we reach the step of doing the actual printing. Using the bioink, our organ is printed layer by layer until we achieve our final product. There's not just one method of bioprinting. Different types include inkjet printing, acoustic printing, and laser printing. The most common type of bioprinting, however, is extrusion printing. This method is probably how you would normally think of 3D printing. The bioink is loaded into a printing chamber and is pushed out around nozzle. The nozzle produces a tiny filament that is often around 400 microns in diameter, or about the thickness of four pieces of paper. Once you've finished the physical bioprinting portion, the final step is solidification. In general, bioink is a viscous liquid. So in order for it to become the desired product, it needs to harden. Sometimes, the bioink will solidify on its own. Other times, the process of cross-linking will occur with the aid of things like exposure to UV light, physical changes like heating or cooling, or chemical changes due to the addition of certain compounds. In a way, 3D bioprinting is very similar to making a cake. First, you have to pre-bioprint. Similar to the medical scans that are used, you have to use a recipe to model your cake after. Instead of using bioink made of cells, hydrogels, and other chemicals, you make a cake batter with eggs, flour, sugar, and other ingredients. Then, you create your cake layer by layer until they all come together just like when 3D printing. Finally, the solidification process is like putting your cake in the oven and letting it harden to achieve the desired product. As the technology of 3D bioprinting continues to be developed, more and more advances are made. Currently, we aren't quite able to produce entire organs due to the complexities of the tissue, but there have still been uses of 3D bioprinting. For example, a tracheal splint 
was created for an infant with TBM and bladders have been constructed for those with end-stage bladder disease. In fact, a rabbit-sized heart was even created in 2019. Other applications of bioprinting can be creating artificial organs, bone tissue regeneration, aiding in cosmetic surgery, and producing living tissue that can be used for pharmaceutical testing without the risk of harming a test subject. In fact, 3D bioprinting is being used to create drug delivery systems that respond to stimuli such as pH, temperature, and light. Thank you for watching.